Welcome to the Bolingbrook Church. We are so excited that you have chosen to spend your time with us today. And if this is your first time, I wanna invite you to let us know so that we can connect with you. And you can do that by filling out our connection card, either through the description box below or on our website on the Connect tab, bolingbrook.church. Now, if you're already part of our family, I'm so grateful you're back. And don't forget to engage, whether it's your first time or you're already a part, to engage in the comments. Let us know what's happening, what you're experiencing, how God is speaking to you through the word today. And I wanna remind you that if you have little ones ages zero to four, you can always go to Disciple Town on Facebook or on YouTube and connect them with programming there that is age appropriate to draw them closer in a relationship with Jesus. Now, as you get ready to worship and as we quiet out the noise and silence the distractions, I ask that your prayer before we start is that God will open up your eyes, open up your ears so that you can see and hear exactly what it is that he wants to show you today. Let's worship. All together right here, I was buried. I was buried beneath my shame. My shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? Who could carry that kind of way? It was my tomb. It was my tomb. Till I met you. Till I met you. Come on, sing it with us. I was breathing. Come on, say it. I was breathing, but not alive. Say all my failures. All my failures I tried. Too high. Come on, say it. It was my tomb. It was my tomb. Come on, say it. Till I met you. Till I met you. Say when you call my name, you call my name. Everybody say, I need it. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chain spray got the way of your glow. I needed shelter. I needed shelter. Come on. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen. Come on, real big. When I was broke. When I was broke. Come on, say it. You were my healing. Now you're.
want you to give God some praise right there that he called your name. That he took the punishment that was meant for you. So that when you see Jesus on that great day, you can enter in heaven knowing that the Lord knows you, that you're faultless before his throne. That's why we sing this song together. Come on, say it. Say, my hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. Than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When dark when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his. I rest on his unchanging grace. Unchanging grace. In every height. In every high. In stormy gale. Come on, somebody say, my anchor holds. My anchor holds within the veil. Come on, sing it out. Everybody say, my anchor. Alone. Praise team, sing it with me. Faultless stand. Faultless, I'll stand before the throne. Can we sing that again? Faultless, I'll stand. today, that he's making ways for you, if you do it, come on, I just want you to think about the ways that he's made, the mountains that he's moved, how he kept you right in the midst of that valley. Come on, if you believe that, won't you ring this out with us today? 
from your heart, won't you say, my God? My God, how great you are. How great, how great you are. Come on, I dare you sing it to yourself and remind yourself today that my God, how great you are. How great, how great you are. Come on, somebody say it. Say, my God, how great. My God, how great you are. How great, how great, how great you are. Oh, hallelujah. Our God is our God, and all will sing. Oh, sing how great! Sing how great your God great is. Come on, ring it out. Somebody say it right here. God. Say it. Sing, my God, how. Sing it out. Weak, made strong. 
God of our weary years and silent tears, the Lord who has brought us this far along the way, my God, how great you are. God, you've seen us through good times and you've seen us through bad times. And then in the midst of each and every single one of those situations, we come out with the same testimony that we serve a great God. God, in the times in which we live, we pray that you would give us an unshakable faith, a faith, God, that can move mountains, but not only a faith that can move mountains, Lord, but a faith that can shift pandemics, a faith, God, that can stop wars and rumors of wars, that, Lord, will allow peace to reign in this land. God, give us a faith that will allow people to know that there is still a God. There is still a God who can transform lives, who can turn people to creations that they've never seen before, God, that within, when you are in our lives, that we are new, that we are better. God, now as we prepare our hearts and our minds for your word, God, open up our ears, remove the distractions so that we may be shift from center to circumference so that we see things your way, knowing that even at the end of this Sabbath, our lives are better because we spent time with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How's it going, Bolingbrook Church family? Thank you all so much for having me here. I'm so blessed to be able to speak to you all today. Today is Serve Sabbath through those who are joining us for the first time. And Serve Sabbath is simply a day where we, on this Saturday morning, uh, all day Saturday, as, as long as it's the Sabbath, we are serving our community. And I'm just so proud to be part of a church that is willing to do things different, that is willing to listen to what God is calling us to do at any given moment, and do whatever that is without fear. We know that God is still moving in our community. We believe Jesus is still at work. We believe the Holy Spirit is still covering his followers and he wants to use us to be a blessing in the community around us. And so I just wanna thank you all for being a part of this church and being part of the movement that God is doing here. I truly believe that God is doing things different here at Bolingbrook Church and I can't wait to show the rest of the world how God can still move. We're going through this sermon series called This Same Jesus. And This Same Jesus as a series is supposed to teach us that Jesus is still moving, that the Holy Spirit is still working, that God is still recreating not only the world around us, but the people that are in this world. And so we just want to thank you so much for being who you are, wherever you are. If you're watching here from Bolingbrook or in the Chicagoland area, or if you're halfway across the world, we've had people from India catch on to the movement here. People across the world, across the globe, you are a part of what God is doing here. And we just want to let you know that wherever you are, you are a space creator. And so we want to continue. I want to continue this series of this same Jesus so that we can all hear a message about how God is still moving in the world around us. We find ourselves in John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Now, it's really cool to know that a lot of the stories that we see in the book of John and in the other Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see stories that last maybe, um, I want to say, anywhere from 5 to 20 verses. When here in John chapter 9, it's the entire chapter is focused around one single story. Now, whenever I see John talk a lot about something, something inside me says to pay attention. When I believe that Jesus starts to speak, when I see that a story is being zoomed in on and details are being fleshed out, I want to believe that God is doing this on purpose so that he can get across a point, a very particular point. And so this is a 40 a 40 verse, 41 verses of a story, and we're going to read through the whole thing. But I want to let you know that today is a day where we can start to see 
a different point of view of not maybe not just this story, but the way we view church and people and the world around us all together. Let's start reading John chapter 9. Bring out your Bibles, or if you're driving, if you're on the road, if you can't access anything right now that you could read, just listen to the sound of my voice as we read God's Word together. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, and that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he said, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went and washed. And he came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am that man. How are your eyes open? They asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud. He put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and I washed. And then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? And so they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. They still did not believe that he was blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. This is why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. Then when they asked him, what did you do? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples too? They hurled insults at him. You are his fellow disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but for this fellow, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, Now this is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. And we know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens only to the godly person who does his will. No one has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this were not from God, he could do nothing. They replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. So that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe and worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him, and they asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Let's pray together. Father, as we 
dive and dissect this word. I'm just praying that you open our eyes, that you help us see something different. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So right here, we start off with verse 1 and 2, where Jesus is with his disciples and they're traveling. And they look at this man that is born blind and and they have this kind of pity. You get this idea from the text that they have this pity on him. Like like they feel like they know what's going on. It's it's really interesting. And I, I want you guys to understand this point. That a lot of the followers of Jesus back in those days, a lot of them were very well versed in text, well versed in church culture. And yet, when they looked at the situation at hand, Jesus knew that they had something wrong. Jesus knew that the people that were experts at culture, at laws, at the Bible, at the Torah, at Scripture, He knew that those people had a very limited view of what the reality of the world was actually like. That He had to help them understand and help them shift how they see. That's going to be a key phrase throughout this whole sermon. God is asking us, To shift how we see. See, the disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned? The man or his parents that he was born blind? See, the disciples had this understanding that the sins of the Father directly affected. There there was this transmigration of a soul from one sinner to the next. And the the more sin and the more, uh, more sinful acts that a person did, that they would have to pay for it in generations to come over and over and over. And so they asked Jesus the same way that in the book of Job, as he goes through all the struggles that he's going through, his friends ask him, Job in his story, they ask him, yo, you must have done something wrong to deserve all of this. And Job responds the same way Jesus responds. I didn't do anything. I, 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 I don't believe I have sinned against God or people around me. And Jesus says the exact same, three, the exact same thing in verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, He's, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. It, it, it's crazy when we, I look at this that I'm seeing people who are following Jesus, who are masters of the law, who understand scripture in and out, who are very well-mannered church people, have mercy, and they still get things wrong. We have to be careful as church people. I'm talking to my church people right here. I'm talking to my church people who, who have been in this culture for a long time. I want to let you know that there are still things that God needs to teach us. There are still shifts that God needs to make because God's Word is always living. It's always breathing. The Bible says that the Word of God is alive and active in the world around us today. That God continues to speak into our lives. That He continues to speak His will into the world around us. Because God, Jesus says that after He resurrected, He has all authority on heaven and on earth. And that whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever is loosed in heaven will be loosed on earth. And here Jesus is trying to let that happen. He's trying to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand right now. You need to see it. He's trying to shift how we see. Jesus here is addressing a very interesting part of their church culture of their theological understanding of things that that there are people whose life circumstances that are around us including this blind man who is born blind there are people that are living in absolute darkness and we as church people might look at them and say that they will always be like that they will always live that way I want to let you know that those people that are living that way, the, the people that are in darkness, the, the, the people that are suffering around us, and even ourselves, get used to the view that we were born with. We get used to the view that we see over and over again. There's a philosophy understanding. It, it, it was uh, uh, built upon Plato's 
uh, analogy of the cave where you have these people facing the wall of a cave, chained to it, and they're forced to only look at the shadows that are being displayed on the wall around them until one person breaks free, goes to experience the world, sees that things are different. They see that things are different and they come back to the cave where people are trained in their darkness, looking at only shadows their entire life. And when this person who had been free comes back to tell them about the world around them, that they can finally see something different, they are threatened by that view. They are threatened because all they have ever seen is the shadows instead of understanding that the shadows were only proof of sunshine behind them, sunshine outside of their view. Maybe Jesus here is doing that exact thing. Maybe he was the originator of, of, of seeing things different. I, I think Jesus is the originator of shifting how we see. There's a darkness that all of us live with. A darkness that we get used to. A way of life that we get used to. A way of church that we get used to. A way of seeing the other people around us. People outside of our church, outside of our building, outside of our lives. We get used to seeing people like that. And so when Jesus introduces something different, there is some sort of contention in our souls. Because it's hard for us to see different, but that is exactly what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to shift how we see. Because you can still have physical sight and not have kingdom vision. I'll, I'll say that one more time. You can still have physical eyesight. Like the rest of the people in the story, other than the blind man. You can still have physical sight and still lack the kingdom vision. The vision that God has, the lens that Jesus views the world through, the lens that he is trying to help us shift into, we can still lack that vision because Jesus is always trying to shift how we see. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. I want you guys to notice that. Jesus says that we must do the works that God sent him to do. I'll read it one more time so you see it. We must do the works of him who sent me. Jesus is inviting us into the work that he is doing. Uh, it, when I was writing this sermon, I could have gone a lot of different ways because a lot of us are church people and we hear this story. We've seen sermons like this before and we might talk about the spit on the ground. We might talk about how Jesus can give us back vision. We might talk about this or that, but I want to focus on the way that Jesus wants to shift our vision. He wants to shift what we see from just him doing all the work to him inviting us into the work that he is doing. I, I want to let you know that Jesus isn't asking us to outsource justice around the world around us. He's asking us to join him on the justice that he is bringing to this world. I, I hope you all are listening to me right now that Jesus is the origin of justice and he is inviting us in this verse we must do the works of him who sent me. We, the church, the people that God is trying to shift and how they see the world around us, he is inviting us into the work that he is doing. Woo! He says, night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6, after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, put on the man's eyes, Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Watch this. This is so cool. I did research because I like to do that. I want to make sure that I get some context in what Jesus is saying here. Here we see Jesus telling him to go to this pool of Siloam. And the Bible says that this means sent. Now, there is some history here that I need you to focus on. This pool of Siloam is directly connected to a tunnel. You see, in those days, in that era, there is the, the spring of Gihon. And that feeds directly into the Kidron Valley. You can go there today 
and the Kidron Valley is dried up. You can look on maps and you can see that there's no more water in the valley. The reason why is because way back in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 20 and in 2 Chronicles, you'll see a king, a very military styled king named Hezekiah. And Hezekiah understood that the spring of Gihon is at a threat. It's vulnerable to attack from enemy. Watch this, watch this. A king realized that the spring of water that feeds the city of God is vulnerable to attack from an enemy. I want to let you know that the Bible talks about how weapons will form, but he says that they will never prosper. Woo, watch this. Hezekiah knew that this spring of great fresh water that would be supplying all of the, the, the city of David, Jerusalem, the city of God, Zion, all of this was dependent on the spring of Gihon and the water that it provides. And so, if he knew that if the enemy can capture that spring of water, if the enemy can surround that spring of water, then the city will be uninhabitable. People will no longer be able to access the living water, whoo, watch this, that comes from Gihon. And so, you can actually still go there today. Hezekiah built a tunnel, a very secret tunnel, that funneled water from the spring all the way south to Mount Zion, all the way to the south part of the city of Jerusalem. And the reason why he did that, watch this, watch this, you got to watch this. The reason why he built that tunnel that you can still go to today is not only does it protect the spring of living water, but it makes it, watch this, accessible to the people of the city. It makes it more accessible to the people that live in the south part of the city, the, the, the part of the city that needs it the most. If ever, ooh, watch this, if ever the city gets surrounded, if ever the people of God get surrounded, there was a tunnel made so that the spring of living water can continue to flow. Woo! I'm not sure if you're catching what I'm putting down here. I'm not sure if you're understanding what kind of shift Jesus is trying to have here. What kind of shift that he might have laid stuff in the past that are now flowing into view in the future. But Hezekiah didn't realize that this redirection of water, that's why they called it scent, because he sent water from the spring and it pooled in another area. Woo, watch this. I want to let you know that the spring of water that comes from the source of heaven, that comes from the very mouth of God, is not meant to stay where it's at. It's meant to be sent to another part, to other parts of a peop for a people that are needing thirst. The, the water that was sent from the source, it might be a solution for those who are struggling with thirst. That people that are out there right now around us, that are dying for the breath of God, dying for the springs of living water that only flow from the temple of God. And what Jesus is doing now, he's inviting us to be conduits of that same spring from the source to the struggle. <laughs> I hope y'all, I wish I could preach this live right now. The fact that Jesus is inviting us to build more tunnels, to be more conduits of living water to areas that need it the most. People are starving and Jesus is sending souls to pools of living water that he has sent from the source. Those pools can and should be us, the church. Maybe Jesus is saying you need to shift the way you think about the source of life. That Jesus is meant to work through you. You're supposed to be a conduit of living water wherever you are. He is asking us to shift how we see. We need to keep moving because I don't want to take too much time. There's so much more that we can talk about here. Verse 8, we're going to jump to verse 8. So he goes to the pool, he's healed, he washes the mud off of his eyes, and his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging, verse 8, 
asked, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, It only looks like him, but he himself insisted, I am that man. How then were your eyes open? He said, A man they called Jesus made some mud to put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, and so I went and I washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked. I don't know. Even Christians, people, people that are followers of God, they will try to discredit the growth that is seen in you by reminding you of the person that you used to be. Uh, People will try to discredit the work that God is doing in you by redirecting your vision to look at what you've done in the past instead of focusing on what Jesus is doing in the present. See, Jesus is trying to shift. These are his neighbors, the people that are close to him, that have seen him all these years, and they are denying the growth that has happened in him. But Jesus, I believe, is trying to help them, I'll say it again, shift how they see. You know what? In the chat right now, to make sure y'all are listening, go ahead and type in, I'm shifting how I see. You see, verse 10, take a look at this. Verse 10, they said, how then are your, ab- are your eyes opened? In reality, they're asking, how are you able to see? What did you do? That You must have done something. In fact, the Pharisees asked, what, what did you do in order to deserve the vision that is being restored in your life? And, and there is no explanation given other than his testimony. There is no explanation of God's work in my life other than me talking about God's work in my life. There's no other explanation of how where I am today looks so vastly different from who I was yesterday other than God's, my testimony of God's work in my life. When we get to heaven and we see people who are, we never thought would be there, I can assure you when we ask them, how did you get here? How were you saved? How did you get a new life? They will simply say that I followed Jesus' words. I listened to what he said. He told me to go here and do this. I did it, and now I'm here. Now I'm saved. At the end of days, the Bible in Revelation chapter 12 says that we overcome the devil with the blood and the sacrifice of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. To simply say that I did not deserve this. I didn't deserve sight. I was born blind. I, I only knew darkness, yet Jesus brought light into my life and I have no explanation for it. Simply to only say that Jesus desired it. That Jesus willed it. No other testimony is given. Because no other testimony can be given other than Jesus wills us to be whole again. That Jesus' main mission is to make us whole, to shift how we see the world around us, the people around us, the God that is working for us, the Jesus that is healing us, to shift everything that we see. They brought to the Pharisee the man who had been blind, Now the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. It's interesting. and I'll take the last five minutes here because it's such an amazing part of this story. Okay, so, so when you take a look at the series of events, a man is born blind. He's being accused of sin. Jesus says it's not his sin or his parents' sin, but that the work of God can be seen through him. And so... The series of events happen like this. A man born blind, mud is being made with spit and dirt, eyes are now opened, and it's the Sabbath. I'll say it again, just so we we understand what's happening here. There is a man born blind. Jesus makes, God makes, Jesus God, makes mud with dirt and spit. He puts it on the eyes. The eyes are then opened, and mind you, it's a Sabbath. Now, now where in the Bible do I see this echoed? My mind is turning, and I I understand that this has been seen before. 
In Genesis chapter 2, what this is my favorite part. In Genesis chapter 2, we see God forming man out of dust. Here's a question. Could Jesus have spoke vision into the man's eyes? The answer is yes. Jesus could have said the word, like he said the word in many healing occasions. But when it came to a man who has only seen darkness, Jesus does something different. He uses his hands, he spits in the dirt, he forms clay, he puts it on the man's eyes, and he tells them to go to a pool to be washed and to have his sight seen, to have his eyes finally opened. Here's another question. Could God have done the same with Adam and Eve? He created the world around us with simply the voice that he has in his mouth. But when it came to human beings, the Bible says that he formed out of the dirt of the ground a human being. He breathed into his lungs and he awoken. His eyes were opened to all the beautiful things around him to all the amazing things, to a wife in front of him. And, and Adam, his, when he opens his eyes, he can't believe what he sees. The world is beautiful. This woman is beautiful. And he did nothing to achieve it. He did nothing and owes nothing to have it. And Jesus opened his eyes and, and maybe the question asked, what do I have to do to deserve all of this? And Jesus says, well, it's a Sabbath. All you have to do is rest. I want to say that the reason Jesus doesn't heal this man with his words because he's echoing a creation that has happened in the past. We're going through this series called This Same Jesus to let you know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That his creative works are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That the way he creates is the same yesterday, today, and forever, all the way in Genesis, all the way here in John chapter 9, and today, right now, God is doing the same thing over and over again, and how He heals is the same. How He creates is the same. How He recreates is the same. He takes His time with His people. He waits, He uses his hands. He doesn't just simply will things into existence with his, with his words, but instead he takes his hands. He gets them dirty. He goes into our mess. He restores our vision. He opens our eyes to a world we've never seen before. And now he says, all you have to do is rest. I've done all the work. You don't need to do anything for me other than rest and know that I did this for you you so that the glory of God can be seen in your life so that when anyone asks you how did you get out of your darkness all you have to say is I listened to the words of Jesus and he changed and he shifted how I see and nothing is the same anymore Jesus is continuing his recreation God is still at work. The same Jesus that was alive then is alive now and he's working in your life. We'll keep reading because this is amazing. We'll jump down to the very end. This, this idea of recreation in Genesis echoes into John chapter 9 and it can echo into our life is seen in this verse. Verse 35, when Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of of man. Jesus heard that he had been thrown out. In the garden, we see a sinful Adam and Eve being thrown out of the garden. But we see something amazing. In Genesis, we see God showing provision, showing a covering to Adam and Eve. A sacrifice was made for Adam and Eve when they sinned and when they're thrown out to the outskirts of Eden, when they're banished from from, uh, from, from the holy lands of God because the law needed that to happen. Jesus is seen, God is seen going to Adam and Eve. Jesus is seen going to this man who is now out of the synagogue, who is out of the, the holy lands. Jesus is seen here, he was seen there, and he's seen right now going to the people that are on the outskirts of society. 
We see Jesus going out of his way, finding the people that are lost, finding the people that need to be welcomed back into a new reality, a new family, a new way of doing church, a new way of gathering, a new way of doing Bolingbrook, a new way of loving. Jesus is going out and he's showing him salvation. Who is he? The man has asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus says, you have seen him. This is the first time this man has seen Jesus. He was blind before. He didn't see Jesus until right now. And Jesus is saying, you are seeing him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. We're doing this thing called Serve Sabbath today. We're starting this new rhythm here at the church because we believe that Jesus is calling us to something deeper. We believe that God is calling us not to just fill our pews, to fill our seats, but fill the hearts of the people that are on the outskirts of society, to fill the hearts of the people that feel rejected by the religious leaders, that feel rejected by their neighbors. Maybe God is sending us the way he sent the source of water out through the conduit of Hezekiah, the tunnel of Hezekiah, to pool somewhere else where people can wash and be renewed. Maybe he's calling you today to shift the way you see so that we can see a new side of God's love in the world around us. We started this serve Sabbath thing because we believe that God is calling us to shift how we see so that the world can see a new view of who God is and how much He loves them. You right now have the chance, you have the opportunity to shift how you see so that the world can see a new view of God's love. I'm so grateful that I serve the same God of yesterday is the same God of today. We want to invite you next week to join us for in-person services. Now, I do want to remind you that as we will gather in person next week, that today is our Serve Saturday and we are gathering online to worship together. But during this time, um, we have a blood drive going on and I believe that there might still be an opportunity for you to sign up if there are spaces available. We're going all the way till noon and we're just excited to serve our community today. But I also want to remind you that there are several other ways that you can serve. Our Bolingbrook Serves Saturday is an opportunity this weekend for you to be able to pour in to the community around you. So it's not just something we're all coming together to do in one location. We want to encourage you. We want to inspire you. We want to move you to want to serve your neighbors. And there's different ways you can do that. You can do that by washing someone's car today, buying their meal, um, calling someone up that you know you needed to talk to but have not had the time. We want you to pour back. We want you to give blessing bags uh, to the homeless in our community. You can donate diapers to our diaper drive. And I just want to take a second and just congratulate you and give you a huge round of applause because we initially started our diaper endeavor with a goal of raising 5,000 diapers. Every food pantry, the biggest need we have in addition to food are people who are needing diapers for their children. And we run out all of the time. And so we said, we want to in one month raise 5,000 diapers, but you guys have not only met that goal, but you have exceeded that goal. And to date, we, we have received 10,500 diapers. And so I don't know if you can feel my excitement, but I am just so grateful and so excited for what the community of God has come together to do so that our community here in Bolingbrook can know that no matter when they come, there will be diapers for their children. And it is because of you, your dedication, your commitment, and your desire to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world that we have been able to super surpass this goal. And so thank you so much for your continued dedication and commitment 
to this community. And so today we're inviting you to go out and serve. And now you can serve all weekend. It could be today, it could be tomorrow. Um, but when you do, we're asking you for the purpose of inspiring others to take a picture or take a quick video and hashtag Bolingbrook serves. And that will give us an opportunity to push it out and let people know what we're doing, how we're making a difference as simple as connecting with a neighbor, because the truth is that it's the simple acts that truly make the biggest difference. And so we want to encourage you to do that. We're also looking for volunteers for the food pantry on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. And so if you're interested in serving and you have some time to serve, go ahead to bowlingbrook.church and under food pantry you can sign up to volunteer to give out food and diapers we cannot wait to put all the diapers out there on tuesday for people to come and get them and so thank you again as always we want to just encourage you to continue to pour in and invest to this community and your investment is not just financial but your presence is an investment your time is an investment through serving through joining the teams that that need uh, volunteers but also we just want to thank you for those of you who've dedicated the time uh, and resources to support this community because of you we can continue to create spaces for the people God misses the most. And so we thank you for that. And we know that God will continue to carry that work far beyond these four walls. We're so grateful and we can't wait to see you next week.